All right, good morning. Uh, before we start this morning, I have an announcement. Uh, last night at uh, 2117, we had uh, baby Charlotte was born. So everything looks good. Mom and baby are at home uh, this morning. So uh, 10 fingers, 10 toes, eight, what it, uh, 7 pounds, 12 ounces, 20 inches long. She's perfect. She's just fine. Just fine. Maggie's doing well. So that's number six. And um, I thought, I asked Maggie if she was going to, I told everybody that I was going to bring her in for the, uh, at the pulpit this morning, but the midwife said she couldn't go to church today. So we'll do that next week. I'll show her off to you guys next week. So yes, that's a new, so if I look a little tired this morning, that's why. I like to start off, this was recently in the paper. This is in the uh, Bonner County Daily B. This was a letter in the opinion column, it says uh, abortion, the connection between law and morality. Some letter writers don't seem to comprehend the relationship between law and morality. While morality and law are not one and the same, the relationship between the two is undeniable. Law is related to, moral, to a moral obligation since law, as a command, necessarily implies an obligation. When enough people think that something is immoral, they will often work to have a law that forbids it and punishes those who do it. The society that parses these things is influenced by its own personal beliefs and cultural ideologies. This is in the newspaper. Therefore, when the pro-abortionists screech about women's rights and abortion laws, they are imposing their own moral beliefs on what they think the law should be. To then say that others have no right to bring their beliefs about morality, morality to bear on the issue is hypocritical and simply wrong-headed. The pro-birth argument, often used by radical ad- activists, is just as inflammatory as propaganda. They attempt to make it this into a binary choice. Either you care for the woman or you care for the unborn child in her womb. Why not both? These radicals, in their zeal for women's rights, almost always avoid discussing the victim of an abortion, the dead baby. When smoke and, with smoke and mirrors, they'll refer to conspiracies, pro-birth propaganda, and gun control to divert your attention. To them, personal autonomy and freedom of choice trump all, even human life. At the end of the day, a human being is being destroyed in an abortion, and they'll avoid talking about it at all costs. Now that fits what we've been studying recently, but that was in our own newspaper. And this guy was in uh, Clark Fork, which is right around the corner from us. So apparently there are like-minded people. He's not a member of this congregation, but I'm sure if we had a discussion with him, we'd find we believe, uh, we'd have a lot of, uh, in common about our beliefs. <coughs> so that's on the heels of what we're discussing today, which is uh, covenant membership. Last week I read a... Um, letter from uh, one of my best friends, and he had called early, uh, last week, and he had asked a question <coughs> about a uh, verse. He's, remember, I said he was reading through the Bible again, and he'd run over a verse in Exodus that was a really odd verse to him, and he wanted to know what was going on. The verse in question is in Exodus 4, and uh, to uh, kind of paint the picture where we're at, we'll start in verse 21. So Moses is told to go to the house of Pharaoh and uh, tell Pharaoh what t- uh, to let go of Israel. Otherwise, things would come upon him and his house. Exodus 4, verse 21, And then the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return unto Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. If thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So this is where we're at. You guys are familiar with this story. Here's where the verse 24 is where the question started. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So let him go, that she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. That does seem to be a very odd detail right here in the middle of Moses going to Egypt. And I'm sure 
Not a lot of us have ever given it much thought, but here it seems that God is about to kill Moses. And my buddy said, hey, what's going on here? God's about to kill Moses. What's, this is really odd. And I was like, well, if you look through, um, I told him uh, this is not something that can be easily answered in just a single phone call. So that would be the subject of this morning's sermon. I told him to watch so he'd figure this out with us. But I did tell him, look, when you read this, the first things, there should be a few things that jump out at you in this little story. One, we have a death penalty, which would mean that God has to have two witnesses. So that's going on. Two, we have a circumcision. And three, apparently here at the Zipporah, we have a marriage. Because we see here a bloody husband. In other translations, it would be uh, blood bridegroom. Uh, Pharaoh Fenton and the Septuagint say the same thing. So all of these ideas, this death penalty, uh, circumcision, and marriage, now these all, are first and foremost, have something to do with obeying the first commandment because this is tied into the idea of covenant membership. Covenant membership. And I'll explain. In the first commandment, we're told, you shall not have any gods before me. So, in so doing, you are to obey God only. And in the Old Testament, there are two basic rites of the covenant that God made with us. Two basic rites or rituals. Circumcision, the ordinance, and the Passover. Okay, those were two things we had to show, do to show that we were within the covenant between the Hebrew people and God himself. Now, the New Testament, of course, we have baptism and communion. Those are what those are in today's terms. So look at Genesis 17. We'll go to the uh, covenant way back with Abraham. we we'll go to Genesis 17 quickly. Verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in thy generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man among you shall be circumcised. So here's the law, or at least a term of the covenant here. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or, brought with, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is brought, bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So see, here's a symbol or sigil of the covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her by her name Sarai, but Sarah shall bless, and Sarah shall her name be, and I will bless her, and give thee a son of her also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Now that would be the son of promise. Isaac, but here's this covenant, and Abraham's to abide by these. If you look over, the verse shows us here that the institution of circumcision is function as a sign of the covenant. So we have to understand what circumcision was in the Old Testament, and notice here this would be a blood covenant between Abraham and his physical, uh, between Abraham, Sarah, their physical seed, and God Himself. You look over at uh, 17:1 right there, and when Abraham. Abram was 90 years old and nine. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Genesis 18, verse 17. Look over there quickly. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So here, in order for God to honor the covenant, according to 17 and 18, the covenant he made to Abraham, in order for him to honor that, Abraham is required to be obedient to God. Okay? But this is what's where it gets odd. Because some kingdom churches and some kingdom ministers in this land claim that all you would have to do to be saved is be a physical seed of Abraham. Yet in Genesis I'm reading that the physical seed of Abraham have to be circumcised. Now wait a second, I thought it was enough that if we're already saved by race, 
in this case, being a physical seed or son of Abraham, then why go through the whole thing in circumcision? Because it's a redundancy, correct? So it must be, the sign of the covenant must be something else. As we go along, we'll see it's an attitude. But apparently, just being a physical descendant of Abraham is not enough to make you a covenant member of the congregation of Israel. That's because there exists in this world people who are true Israelites who are at the same time unclean, unbelieving apostates. So it's not enough to be Abraham's seed. Apparently, you have to go through this, the Old Testament, the rite of circumcision. We'll go on and we'll get more into depth as we go along this morning. And when I say unbelievers, I mean people who both, people who won't have anything to do with God or Christianity, or those who may read the Bible but then refuse to do what it says, or even believe it says what it says. And if you go along and you don't believe me that that happens in this earth, we'll have to look at the uh, parable of the seeds, the sower that Jesus gave us to see that there are different people, and the attitude towards the law is what, in effect, has them agree and walk with God or deny Him. Now, we can read all about the New Testament equivalent of the circumcision in the uh, Romans 2 and Colossians 2. And we read about how Paul talks about the circumcision of the heart. Correct? We've gone over this before. Therefore, if we tie all this together, circumcision in the Bible stands for justification, regeneration, and sanctification. Okay, and we'll get on to what baptism means too. Now, to back that up, I'm just going to look very quickly at one of the laws to make sure we're within it. Let's go to Leviticus uh, 12. Leviticus 12, 3. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So there's Levitical law concerning that. And also in Exodus 12, anyone who wished to partake in the Passover, whether Hebrew or foreigner, had to be circumcised. Okay, so that's the function of circumcision as well. Uh, according to Luke 1 and 2, uh, both Jesus and John the Baptist were circumcised, as was uh, Paul, according to Philippians 3.5, and Timothy, according to Acts 16.3. So, you know, this still went on. Now, as for laws in respect to women, uh, Leviticus 12 also covers, if you look here, it covers the ceremony of purification for women, which is related to the same concept of the circumcision for men. And you'll see there's different offerings made. And you remember uh, Jesus' mother Mary brought uh, offerings up to the temple because he was a male. And if you had a female, then there was also purification rituals to do with the woman that actually gave birth and all that. Now, if we look at Deuteronomy 10, it's very surprising scriptures that are skipped most often by the new churches today. Deuteronomy 10, verse 16 says... Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Now, that's New Old Testament theology telling us that the circumcision of the heart, as we related in Jeremiah later, will tell us the same thing. Also, you'll read it in the epistles of Paul. And for a second witness of the Old Testament theology concerning the circumcision of heart, which will point the way to Jesus the Christ, is Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. The benefit of keeping the law is you get a few more moons. And here it says that tied in with loving God is the circumcision of the heart or your attitude towards God's word. That's it, really. It's, it's that easy. So covenant righteousness is what circumcision conveys. You see? Baptism now is a sign of the renewed covenant between Israelite believers to God, and it replaces the ordinance of circumcision. It replaces the ordinance of circumcision. And there are those out there that teach the kingdom that will heartily disagree with me. The sprinkling of the water, remember in Ezekiel? The sprinkled in it. The sprinkling is a sign of the regeneration of us, the covenant people, after our captivity, and is associated with a new heart. The new heart, as Jeremiah 31 says, is actually the covenant with Christ. You see? So this is how it ties in, and this is why the Old Testament ordinances at the time of Christ's death were done away with. The law ordinances. 
not the law as a whole. Now, John the Baptist's actions indicated that the age of the Messiah was at hand. Remember when he saw Jesus, he baptized him. It's odd that Jesus would be circumcised, obviously he was, and that he still had to go through the baptism though. You see, we're talking about another redundancy. But baptism, like uh, circumcision, is, an, is administered to the child unless, a new, uh, unless an adult is newly converted. As a matter of fact, we have adults that wish to be baptized here in this church. So as for children, we read that the circumcision of the male child was on the eighth day. And this does have a scientific basis, by the way. I looked it up. Uh, because newborns, the uh, eighth day is when the blood can properly coagulate and the wound can heal. This is due to the uh, proper formation of platelets. Platelets are highly organized anuclear cellular fragments involved in primary hemostasis, or the stoppage of bleeding. Platelets act by attaching to adhesion molecules exposed by breaks in the endothelial walls, aggregating together and altering their shape, primary hemostasis, this is followed by activation of the coagulation cascade and fibrin disposi uh, disposition to form a mature clot. That's how our blood clots. According to the scientific journal, platelet counts decline over the first few days after birth, but then begin to rise one week later. So there's the science that backs up the eighth day. Just as God knew what he was doing when he gave us the eighth day. It's not an oddball number he just threw out there. But yes, scientists, science and the Bible agree, once again. Anyway, in the early church, uh, eighth-day baptism was practiced. Uh, biblically, the child was not allowed to come of age and then decide on circumcision or later baptism, you see. And this is a very important concept. Salvation is not man's choice then, but by God's choice, Therefore, the, the rites of circumcision and the ordinances of circumcision and the rites of baptism make it clear also that the choice is God's. You see, it's not about the asking the child about circumcision. It's not about that. The parents in doing this give their child to the Lord with the promise to raise or rear the child in the covenant grace and law. The rest is up to God, you see. So, back to Moses. And you understand now, that is not, Jesus would never was asked his opinion on whether or not he was going to be circumcised on the eighth day. You see, the parents in baptism give the child to God and say, we swear, we make an oath to raise this child in your word. The rest is up to God. And you see how, much, how many choices children are given even about their own gender today. The Bible does not, the Bible does not spell out children to be making choices for themselves. It does not. Parents are under an obligation to raise the children they have in God's law word. And we'll get around to that here in a bit. So back to Moses then. Remember, why the death penalty for not circumcising his son? Well, Moses entered into a covenant with God, and as such, it places Moses as a recipient to either God's blessings or curses. In the Bible, this is known as covenant judgment. You don't hear much about covenant judgment anymore. But when you enter into a covenant with God, you are then entitled to his blessings or curses because we all know God will keep his word. It's a reap what you sow concept once again. Moses was in peril because of that double judgment because he was violating the covenant. All those who receive the covenant mark, circumcision, baptism now, are all those who receive the covenant mark are required to bind those under them to the law of God and to his judgment. Now, parents, remember this in keeping with what we've recently discussed, the family unit is central to kingdom Christians and kingdom dominion. When you say you're a Christian, you are in a covenant with God. When you have children, God says, I will tell you what to do with them. And that's a concept that I've argued with many mothers before, that your children do not belong to you. They absolutely do not. You, as calling yourself a Christian, you are under an obligation to raise that child as God says to do so. This includes 
baptism and rearing them in law and grace, of course. Now, that's because the family unit is the strongest law enforcement agency of the kingdom community. And without parents under oath or contract to raise godly children, it starts to fall apart very quickly. And you see where we are now. Why? Well, even Christian parents are not keeping their word to God because the shocking thing is, is when you get baptized, when you sign up for God, you are now... All of this in the fine print law of the Old Testament, you are bound to either keep and receive blessings or ignore omission, receive curses. That's what the Bible says. Choose this day, life or death. Baptism, according to Paul, typifies, among other things, life and death. Death, as in the physical state, of course, and life in the rebirth of Christ. So we understand that's the symbol of coming up and down out of the water. The same holds true for circumcision in the Old Testament. It ratified an oath-curse covenant and signified not only a new life in the Lord's covenant, but also death for those who broke or denied the covenant. Remember the Passover, right? So these covenants come with life or death consequences. Circumcision as a symbol of that. Also, baptism. We'll see what's going on here with Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 10. Speaking of baptism, now in the New Testament, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Go to 1 Peter 3. I'll read that one very quickly. 1 Peter 3.20 says, Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was, a, was preparing, within few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not by putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, Paul in Corinthians described Israel's Red Sea ordeal as a baptism. And Peter called the Noahic flood a baptism as well. Both of these instances had life and death consequences, you see. Look at Matthew 3. We'll get into Jesus' baptism and why it was a necessary thing or a step. Matthew 3 Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay, that's John the Baptist speaking of Jesus. Second witness will be in Luke 3. Luke 3, 16, I read, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. These statements, well, rather one, as it's found in at least two of the synoptic gospels, also seem to point out baptism's dual destinies. You see the life and death concept within baptism. The life and death concept within the oath curse concept of God's covenant people. You see what we're under now. It's very serious. The Old Testament theology concerning God's judicial acts of separating those of the circumcision and cutting off others from the congregation of Israel. You see the circumcision carries the same basis of life and death. The cutting off. It also brings to mind several of Jesus' parables which mention a cutting off or separation. Um, The tares and the wheat come to mind. It's life and death once again. Now let's look at the function of Jesus' baptism. Obviously he was circumcised. He was baptized. And now look at what he says about it. If we go to Luke 12, he's going to give a parable here in Luke 12, verse 36. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding that he that cometh and knocketh that may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, 
when he cometh shall find watching, verily say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Verse 38, And if he shall come in the second watch or in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. But ye therefore are ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. So this is Jesus' return. And he's telling this in a parable. And then Peter asks a question. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? And this is Jesus' ex- explanation in verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, but and if the servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and be drunken, The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in asunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew the Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Here's a consequence right here in a parable about disobeying or ignoring God. But he that knew not and did not commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. And I come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I will, and here's the baptism. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened that it become accomplished. Suppose ye that I come to give peace on the earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Now there's another statement by Jesus mentioning baptism and how it has a divisive aspect. So, Mark 10, 38. If you go to Mark 10, this is where the sons of Zebedee were asking uh, Jesus who was going to be his favorite and who'd sit where. You remember that? Sons of Zebedee. It's Mark 10, verse 38. And yes, uh, verse 35 is James and John, sons of Zebedee, Master who would, uh, Zebedee, Master, we would that thou shouldest do us for whatever we shall desire. Verse 37, they said unto him, Grant us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and one on the other of thy left hand, in thy glory. Verse 38. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know what not ye ask? Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So what is this that Jesus is talking about? So all of this, we'll get into this, it will help us more easily understand Jesus' baptism in terms of law. As a covenant servant, Jesus submitted to the judgment of God by way of the symbol of baptism. This judgment is from God, and as such, it comes from a desire. Uh, this carries with it a divine verdict of death. So Jesus was put under. This is what he's talking about here. Jesus consecrated himself unto his sacrificial death, which offered him up to the curse of death. It's the function of his baptism. Only after his baptism, then, did he just start his ministry, which began with the temptation in the wilderness and eventually led to his crucifixion and resurrection. As upon his resurrection, his kingdom age started. As we know. His baptism is what entered him into the covenant, you see. That's why his ministry began then. Baptism to us mortals is what signifies our covenant relationship with God and makes us his servants. Because there was a, Jesus really didn't have to be baptized, did he? to go on with his mission. Not really, but why did he do that except for us to see what it did, its function, and that we should do the same as Christ-like people? So if Moses, then, was to carry out God's divine commission with any success, he had to first prove himself to be a faithful servant in his own house. All the way back, we see shadows and types. Without circumcising his son, Moses had violated the covenant 
And if you look at what 1 Peter says, judgment must begin at the house of God, right? Because both the double, because of the double judgment, Moses had to circumcise his son for two reasons. One, the double judgment was upon him for entering into a covenant. Two, the cleansing of God's covenant race. That's the function. Even though, as we've read, it is the uncircumcised themselves who are threatened with death, the, when the case of children, the punishment falls upon the parents. Most of all, the father, this would be Moses, because of he being the head of the home or the head of the home's government. You see, God wasn't about to ask one of the Moses' son, it was either Gershom or the other one, why, what the son thought about it. God looked to Moses and said, hey, as the father, you're in a covenant with me, and that means you're going to do such and so with these children I gave you. I'm going, and God looked directly at Moses and said, why are you derelict in the covenant duties you told me you would uphold? Every time you read the old laws down at uh, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, when they were given to Israel, what is, the, what is it that the Israel people said after God told them? Everything you said, we will do. That's an oath. You go through the New Testament, you come to find out that when Christians give their word, they are to keep it or else suffer a curse. So when you say, God, we wish to be Christians, Christ-like, like you, when we baptize, get baptized, which is the signing up for God, everything about the Ten Commandments and all the fine print in the law applies to you now. That's it. And that's the other, that's things that people have big problems with. Because you're a covenant member of the Israel and you say you wish to follow God and you enter into a covenant membership with God, a covenant that has curse, oath, consequences, you will then not murder. Right? You will not, as covenant kingdom Christians, you will not steal. You will not adulterate contracts, right? You won't eat pork. You will raise your children. People will tell me, well, kids don't come with instruction books, Pastor Reed. Yes, they do. You can read all about what God expects us parents to do with our own children in almost every book in this Bible. Because as a Christian, you have Christian children who you will raise up because that's something you signed up for. It sounds like legal maneuvering, but it's not. It's all here, and it's all part of being a Christian. You, I, would, I would suggest starting with the top ten commandments and then work your way through case laws, and as you figure out they apply to us more and more in this age, you'll say, oh, yes, so if, as Christians, that's definitely something we should be seen doing because as Jesus said in one of his parables, when you know about it and you're not seen doing it, you're as good as the lawless people. That's sin of omission. And that is a sin. Now, remember here um, in the story of uh, in Exodus 4, Zipporah, she took a stone, remember, and circumcised the son. Uh, and then she called Moses a blood bridegroom. A blood bridegroom. The shedding of blood in this case saved Moses' life and in effect purchased him as a new husband. Now, that should start to ring true about what it is Jesus did for us and how he intends to marry us, right? All this. That's a blood covenant. And remember, when we're talking about marriages in the Bible, we're talking about a contract, right? So the shedding of blood saved Moses. She brought him back from the dead. He is a blood husband to her. That should be a little portrait of Israel and Jesus the Christ then right then and there. And what are we talking about? Once again, death penalties, circumcision, or a rite of the covenant, and then being purchased anew by blood. All within three little verses in Exodus 4, you get almost a composite of the gospel. Very nearly. So the sin of Moses then was what? Well, neglecting the covenant by neglecting to circumcise his son. And God went after the parents, you see. Whether Moses knew it or not, that's something he'd signed up for. Raising the child in a godly manner. Now, even though this would technically be uh, omission, it was still a sin. And the consequence of that is that it entered Moses into a judgment, you see. So in studying this, 
I hope that you'll consider our oaths to God more carefully. Neglecting our word and the seals of the covenant that bind us to God displease God. And it displays to Him we undervalue the covenant and the conditions of it. As we are under the terms and conditions of the covenant then, we must always be aware of what we do and what we say. As such, we're in a place to either receive blessings or receive curses. That's your choice. The Bible either means what it says or it doesn't. You either trust God or you don't. That's all I have for today, folks.